7, the Book of Common Prayer. We pray together. Almighty God, unto you all our hearts be open, all our desires open, and to our moving of secrets are given. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said here of Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. These two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, 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 have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. first lesson is written in Exodus, chapter 17, beginning at the first verse. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted for the water there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people, and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. 
Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Here endeth the lesson. Psalm 78. Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears unto the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from a old, which we have heard and known, and such as our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the generation to come, even the praises of the Lord and his might and his wonderful works that he hath done. He made a covenant with Jacob and gave Israel a law, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children that the next generation might know it, and the children which were yet unborn. To the intent that they rose up, they might show their children the same, that they might put their trust in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and not be as their forefathers, a faithless and stubborn generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Like as the children of Ephraim, who being armed and carrying bows, did turn themselves back in the day of battle, they kept not the covenant of God, and would not walk in his law, but forgot what he had done, and the wonderful works that he had showed for them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their forefathers in the land of Egypt, even in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them go through. He made the waters to stand. and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He brought water out of the stony rock, so that it gushed out like the rivers. Yet for all this they sinned more against him, and provoked the Most High in the wilderness. They tempted God in their hearts, demanding the food which they craved. They spake against God also, saying, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? He smote the stony rock indeed, that the waters gushed out and the streams flowed withal. But can he give bread also, or provide flesh for his people? When the Lord heard this, he was wroth. So the fire was kindled in Jacob, and there came up heavy 
displeasure against Israel. Because they believed not in God and could not bear trust in his help, yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down man also upon them for to eat, and gave them food from heaven. So man did eat angels' bread, for he sent them food enough. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. The epistle is written in Philippians, beginning at chapter 2, the first verse. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in, in, in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here ends the lesson. Could you please rise for the gradual meeting?
and all faith. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. And they said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you. Confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, the God of the Father before all. did make eloquent with the words of infants for the goodness of your blessing on these lessons. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
begin with uh, an apology to the choir for stealing material. If I live another two weeks, I will welcome it. Uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, years ago, toward the end of our uh, theological student days, a friend who was being held up, held back by his mental health and his sexuality. Uh, this friend uh, began to write a book, and uh, the book was of the kind that you often meet, the dummy's guide or the idiot's guide, uh, but his was about the history of Christianity, and um, he never uh, published the book, or that book, uh, in fact he never finished writing the book, uh, but I remember reading in draft the first sentence of the book, which has never left me. And although I might not have the grammar perfect, I believe it went this way. Line one of the history of Christianity, the humility of the early Christians was legendary. Apparently, they had a lot to be humble about. Now, he's really echoing what the Apostle Paul himself says in the end, or toward the end, of the first chapter of his first letter to the Christians in Corinth when he says to them, you know, not many of you were intellectuals when you entered this church. Not many of you were influential people. Not many of you came from good families. But that's okay. In fact, it's better than okay because that's not how God works. God takes the humble things of the world and then the great things. In our thinking about humility, we run into a problem immediately. And I don't know if you've thought about this, you probably have, and that is that the word humility falls so differently on our ears, even on ourselves at different moments. Uh, some of us have grown up seldom to doubt ourselves. Uh, some of us can always question ourselves and our value. Uh, sometimes we have a different persona in public and in private. Some people are good at public humility, not good at private, and vice versa. So we have to be very careful that we don't equate what Scripture is talking about to some sort of psychological advantage or disadvantage in us. There is a time to be proud, and there is a time to trumpet our form. And there's a difference between a CV and presenting ourselves and how we really live our lives. So what we're talking about today, I think, is the root of humility, the thing that should sit in our soul and guide how we think and how we live. And our first clue comes from the story in the book of Exodus. This is the third of the we want to go back to Egypt stories in the book of Exodus. And in this story, the people are quarreling, they're complaining, and there's almost a legal edge to what they're saying, as if, I'm going to take you to court. We want water. We want it now. Now these stories in among our ancestors, the stories of our ancestors in the faith, especially stories like this, you think would drop out over the centuries. But we hung on to that story, and not just in the stories in the book of Exodus, but this particular story is echoed, or has a story very much like it, in the biblical book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, and in five different psalms, including the psalm that we heard this morning, and in the book of Hebrews. This is deeply rooted in our faith, and this is something that we should recall that humility is remembering the truth. Humility is remembering the truth about ourselves. Not about other people, but about ourselves. In the Gospel story, there's another remarkable and outraging uh, saying by Jesus. At the end, uh, toward the end of the Gospel, actually at the very end of the Gospel, Jesus uh, says to uh, a group of important people, um, the most important clergy, uh, the scholars, the leading lay people of his time. And he says to them, you know what? The hookers and the swindlers are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. 
and we wonder what he means when he says that. He's clearly not saying, given what else Jesus says, that there is a, an advantage in trading sex for money or money for sex or swindling people out of money when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. But he says that these really terrible exchanges aren't the point. The point is that the people, that the leaders, that the righteous look down upon were able to know the truth during the ministry of John the Baptist. That is what he's saying. And they didn't want to be that way. So added to the telling of the truth in this story that Jesus tells about John the Baptist and those who responded to John the Baptist is this desire to change. And he says to the leaders, to the people maybe like you and me, he says, they're ahead of you on the road into the kingdom of God. In fact, you may not even be on the road because you can't speak the truth about yourself. And if you can't speak the truth about yourself, you can't change. So Paul says in the epistle to the Philippians, the second chapter, which you've also heard this day, which includes a hymn or a poem probably uh, about Jesus, he says, have the mind, have the right mind when it comes to yourself. When he wrote to the Romans in the 12th chapter, he said, have a sober assessment of yourself. So humility, a Christian virtue, is not putting ourselves down or asking other people to put themselves down. Humility is the virtue of thinking rightly about ourselves. What's wrong with ourselves, what's right with ourselves, what our gifts are, what our gifts aren't, that is humility. It's thinking and speaking the truth. And so he says in his epistle to the Romans, have, this, have that mind. Have the mind that tells the truth. Think soberly. Think truthfully about yourself. In his letters to the Philippians, he relates this sober assessment, this honest humility, to the problems of the church, which were quarreling and fighting amongst each other, just as it was in the case of Rome and in the case of and he says to them, have the mind of Christ. How can we have the mind of Christ? He says himself in this epistle that he is talking about the incarnate Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who we just confessed in the three. How can we have a mind like him? And what does it mean to say that Christ was humble? But really what the Apostle Paul was saying is that Christ accepted his humanity. He humbled himself to death, even the death on a cross. We who are to imitate Christ and take our cues from the epistles and hear the stories of our ancestors about telling the truth don't need to imagine that Jesus humbled himself because of his sin. He humbled himself because he accepted the reality of being a human being. And so we need to accept the truth about ourselves. And as Paul says to the Philippians, to be generous in our assessment of others. What would the world look like? What would this church look like? What would our evenings look like if everybody was honest about themselves and generous about others? Honest, not self deprecatory not down on ourselves, but if we were just honest about ourselves, and generous about others who we can't really understand and see inside. It would be a different place. And that would put us, says Jesus, that would put us, says the epistles, on the road into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're called to do this because of the overwhelming grace of God. The more we are honest about ourselves, the more we'll meet the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And that's really why we come here every week. It's to be honest about ourselves or we have no confession of sins. And it's to enjoy the grace and forgiveness of God or we would not celebrate what we do. Humility is a Christian virtue. It's long acquired and it begins with telling the truth. Not necessarily trumpeting the truth, 
but knowing the truth about ourselves and living out of that truth, feeling the changing grace of God in our lives. And for that, we give thanks to this name. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Would you please rise for the offertory?